All right, so I wanted to begin with a very nice picture of Von Norman. Being a genius, well, um, he worked in many different areas of math and uh, less, uh, you know, left lasting contributions to many of them. And he was asked uh, later in his life, which did he consider as his uh, most significant contributions? And he said mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics and continuous dimension theory. And uh, I will speak a little bit uh, about both of these aspects. And because of his interest in the mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics, von Neumann was uh, interested in the bounded linear operators on uh, Hilbert space. And uh, to be honest, he was mostly interested in unbounded operators, but then you would study unbounded operators by cutting them down. And just like you do in measure theory to study a measurable function, you cut down the measurable function. And it's similar to measure theory, where uh, you know pointwise convergence plays a key role. Here we have the version of pointwise convergence, which we call the SOT or strong operator topology convergence. And uh, the, the beautiful theorem of von Neumann, the bicommutant theorem that he proved in the mid twenties, says that whenever you have a star subalgebra of B of H then the strong operator topology closure coincides with the double commutant, which leads naturally to the definition of a von Neumann algebra. And uh, examples are, uh, first few examples are easy to obtain. B of H itself could be a von Neumann algebra, H could be finite or infinite dimensional. And also you have L infinity of zero one. Now notice that um, L infinity of zero one, this is an abelian von Neumann algebra and is very different from B of H, which does not have a center. And we call a von Neumann algebra M to be a factor if the center is trivial. Somehow the study of von Neumann algebras, uh, you know, breaks down into the study of factors and study of abelian von Neumann algebras where it, uh, just measure theory takes over. So we shall be mostly interested in the study of factors. And so far so good, von Neumann was pretty pleased to, with uh, to the development, except he had the nagging question that are there any other examples? And he gave this problem to his postdoc Murray, and they quickly realized that there are indeed other examples coming from groups. These are the so-called group on Neumann algebras, which we saw in the last talk. We also saw in Professor Peterson's talk this morning. So I'll just uh, you know quickly go over it. The important facets of this construction is that you have a normal uh, faithful tracial state, and uh, this makes uh, L of gamma into a genuinely different object. For, uh, from B of H when the H is infinite dimensional. This is the finiteness condition that uh, is really the key difference. And these are the objects that they called a two one factor, that this is an infinite dimensional factor and makes a faithful normal trace. And uh, uh, the key example that they had basically was uh, these group von Neumann algebras when your group is ICC. And in fact, this was the only example that they had at that point uh, about uh, the two one factors. Nevertheless, the facet of uh, two one factors that got von Neumann most excited was that if you look at the traces of this projection the, in this von Neumann algebra, then the set of traces is actually this whole closed interval zero to one. And by the way, from now on, script M would always be a two one factor. And uh, if I forget, it will always come with a uh, unique trace tau. Now, uh, this uh, development that uh, the uh, traces of projection is this whole closed interval zero one. This is what led von Neumann to his study of continuous geometry, continuous dimensions, and so on. And we shall see just a one manifestation of uh, having these um, trace set being equal to this whole closed interval. And what von Neumann wanted to do using this fact is construct T by T matrices over a given von Neumann algebra M, given to one factor M, where t could be it's, uh, any it's a positive real number. Notice that if you started with some natural number, then it's, uh, n by n matrices over term, uh, von Neumann algebra is obtained simply by taking the tensor so product with n by n matrices. And this is again a two one factor. Now for a, it's a real number that's uh, not an integer, a positive real, you can do basically the same procedure where you would do a cut down of this uh, tensor product or the, you know, just uh, it's a cut down in case t it's, uh, lies between zero and one. 
And uh, this amplification or compression should be thought of as T by T matrices. That is what von Neumann wanted to think about. And uh, notice how beautifully this um, uh, cutting down by projection plays with this fact that I had written over there. And one of the key reasons why von Neumann wanted to do that, uh, that he was excited, is that now if you start with any two one factor, you get all of these continuously managed uh, different new examples of type two one factors. Except there is a slight glitch. They quickly realize is that, uh, well, is it uh, obvious that uh, you know, these amplifications will be isomorphic to the original algebra or will not be isomorphic to the original algebra? And they in fact answered their own question by uh, noting that if you look at the so-called hyperfinite type two one factor, then all the amplifications are isomorphic to the original two one factor that you started with. And they also realized that this uh, set of values such that the amplification is isomorphic to the original type two one factor is an important isomorphism invariant of this two one factor. And uh, they called it the fundamental group. This forms a multiplicative subgroup of the positive real line. And so the modified question then becomes, does there exist a two one factor which has non-trivial, I mean, which has fundamental group different from the positive reals? And this is really a very difficult question. In fact, if I give you a two one factor, understanding what its fundamental group is, is uh, absolutely you know very difficult problem in general. If you could do this for the group, group von Neumann algebra of uh, the free group on two generators, you would solve the isomorphism problem, a problem that probably is one of the hardest in this area. And in fact, it took uh, three decades and Alan Kahn to come up with a solution to this question. And Kahn's solution was that if you start with any infinite ICC property T group, and consider it's a group von Neumann algebra. First of all, it will be a type two one factor and you will have that uh, the fundamental group is countable. I should mention that um, he, uh, Kohn did not do any explicit calculation. His um, argument was uh, basically topological in nature so where he could show that this must be countable without actually calculating what the fundamental group is. And of course, there are many examples of property T groups. One of the key examples are uh, SLNZ, where N is bigger than or equal to three. But I also wanted to mention that there are hyperbolic property T groups in abundance, which also you had seen in Daniel Strong that he used hyperbolic uh, property T groups. And uh, this basically, this uh, observation together with his work uh, on property T groups, uh, to, on property T factors, and also motivated by some work by Mark Bullis, uh, Kant made a very bold conjecture. And the fun fact is that he made the conjecture in the Kingston Summer School, Ontario, Canada, which I believe is where we would be under normal circumstances. And the conjecture that he made was that uh, the, if you start with an ICC property T group, then so the group must be W star super rigid, meaning that whenever you have L of gamma isomorphic to L of lambda, then gamma has to be isomorphic to lambda. And uh, there still are no known examples or counterexamples to this conjecture. However, the, uh, you know, so this beautiful conjecture has really so motivated many developments in the theory of uh, type two one factors. And it was uh, realized that perhaps a stronger form of Kahn's conjecture could hold true. And uh, I saw the uh, strong form of Kahn's conjecture, for instance, in Popper's ICM paper uh, from 2005, uh, which says that, um, if you start with an ICC property T group gamma, and suppose that L of gamma is isomorphic to an amplification of L of lambda, then T is equal to one and gamma is isomorphic to lambda. In fact, the strong form says more, it says more about how this isomorphism should look like. But let's not get into that because um, being T equals one for the case even uh, gamma equals lambda makes it interesting because it predicts that the fundamental group has to be trivial. And in fact, this appears explicitly as a conjecture in the purpose of open list of problems. And uh, Kahn himself asked this problem in his non-commutative geometry book where uh, he was uh, less explicit about what the answer should be. He just uh, wanted to calculate fundamental groups of L of gamma where gamma is an ICC property T group. And notice that this question um, is uh, really motivated by uh, 
the conjecture he made over here. So it gives me immense pleasure to give this talk. It's uh, over here at OZ because uh, I wanted to mention the first examples where we could do it. This is based on a joint work with units, um, uh, Cyril and Krishnendu. Krishnendu will give uh, uh, the talk after this and he will speak more in and around these results. So the result says the following. Suppose you have a, a group in uh, something that we denote by class S and consider its group one Neumann algebra, then you get that the fundamental group is trivial. And of course, I haven't told you yet what the class S is, hence it's in red. Here's the TLDR version. Classes consist of infinitely many ICC property D groups. And uh, you can construct these groups from something called uh, Belegrade Gosen's Rips construction. I'll get into more details about this construction just in a second. One thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, we were also interested in the question whether the classes uh, or maybe some minor modification of this uh, actually consists of uncountably many groups. But the upshot now is that there are infinitely many examples uh, of uh, property T group factors, mutually non-isomorphic, which have trivial fundamental group. And uh, let's uh, go ahead and try to uh, define what uh, this class S is. Uh, this really comes from our work of Belagradic and Osen, who showed that if you start with any finitely generated group, you can find a property T group N such that Q embeds into the outer automorphism group of N as a finite index subgroup. And this already was a pretty big deal because this did answer a question of Alan Vallet who asked that uh, if you start with a property T group, uh, what is the outer automorphism? Is it always finite or not? And uh, what they showed is that the outer automorphism group could basically be everything. Uh, the first time it was solved was uh, due to Olivier and Weiss, I think in the uh, year 2004 or 2005, Belagradic and Osen gave uh, another kind of uh, construction. And this would be our starting point. Because uh, now, to, because of this fact that Q embeds into out N, we can canonically consider this semi-direct products, right? And uh, one key fact about this semi-direct product that we use in the proof heavily is that the semi-direct product group is hyperbolic relative to the group Q. And of course, we want ICC and probability T to get that. What you have to do is start with Q torsion free, then N you can pick to be torsion free, and therefore these would be ICC. Also, uh, you can start with Q to be a probability T group, then uh, because N has probability T, as I said, this semi direct product will have probability T. And these are the kind of groups that we'll call RIPS Q. And this is the starting point of classes where we considered a product group of the form Q1 times Q2, where these are non-trivial hyperbolic property T, residually finite torsion free ICC groups. Now, I should mention that um, it looks like a lot of assumption, but residually finite is uh, not a big deal. All known examples of hyperbolic groups uh, that we know so far are residually finite. Torsion free isn't a big assumption as well. So, you know, you can take uniform lattices in SPN1, those will be torsion free, for instance. And uh, then what you do is um, crank up the Reeves machinery and get two different groups as N1 and N2, could be the same group, could be different. And look at N to be the product group, N1 times N2, and consider the diagonal action. Uh, of Q on N1 times N2, and this is the group G. And the category of all of these semi-direct products, this we shall denote by class S. And um, now that I've told you what class S is, and I've told you our result, let's um, look very briefly to, uh, on to how we uh, you know, went ahead to try and prove this result. And the major ingredient, of course, is uh, Popper's deformation rigidity theory. In fact, uh, what we use is um, mainly his intertwining techniques, which uh, let's uh, quickly recall the definition. If you start with two um, not necessarily unital subalgebras of a Trachel von Neumann algebra, we say that P intertwines into Q inside M if a corner of P embeds into a corner of Q in a very nice manner. Now, the reason why uh, intertwining is uh, interesting and such powerful is that on good days, on really very good days, from intertwining, you can deduce that uh, the unitary conjugacy. And this is the kind of thing that we are after from uh, some sort of weaker condition like intertwining gets unitary conjugacy, which will play a key role in our proof. And in fact, Popper's deformation rigidity theory in general and intertwining techniques in particular have played a key role in the last uh, couple of decades and has produced immensely many results. So 
I just wanted to mention briefly some of the, the you know, the big results um, that were possible. And this would be a very short list, just a drop in the ocean, but uh, it's, uh, just to give you an idea of some of the big results. So what Popa uh, could do in 2001 is uh, construct the first examples of that one factors with trivial fundamental group. And while this group obviously does not have property T, does use relative property T. So again, property T uh, in some form or the other uh, is present um, in his construction. And then you know, uh, Peterson and Popper uh, in 2005, they gave the first examples of two one factors with trivial outer automorphism group. And uh, they also could show, uh, uh, they also could find examples of that two one factor, such so that if you start with any multiplicative subgroup, of positive uh, real numbers, then you can construct a type 1 factor which has fundamental group equal to that subgroup that you have chosen. And uh, th this is uh, their construction. And finally, th the last result that I really wanted to mention th is um, a result due to Yona Popa and Vaz, who gave the first examples of W star super rigid groups. I'll not write down those groups, but you will see them in the Krishna and Lu's talk. I would just like to mention that the proof uses something called height. And this again plays a key role in our proof. So it's, let's get back to the, the theorem. So the, let me just remind you of the theorem that we want to prove. In fact, we could prove a little bit more general version if you start with any two groups, gamma and lambda in classes, and uh, consider their uh, corresponding proof on Neumann algebra. Suppose you have a star so isomorphism between M and uh, an amplification of N, then T has to be equal to one. And uh, let me uh, quickly go over to, uh, some of the methods. So first of all, you know that it suffices to assume that T has to be between zero and one, just because uh, you otherwise you can consider M raised to the power of one over T. And uh, this is the sufficient case. And now to, uh, let us suppose that uh, our algebras look like this. They are semi-direct product algebras. And just consider a uh, non-zero projection to, in the core and assume that you have this uh, star isomorphism. Well, the first thing that we are going to do is locate the core of M and uh, relate it with the core of N. What you can show is that uh, the core of um, the algebra script M has to go to the core of the algebra script N after unitary conjugacy, which is uh, not really it's, uh, that vital because uh, you can always modify your star isomorphism. And the proof of this uses uh, intertwining. You first show that uh, the, you have a back and forth intertwining. And then uh, what we did was uh, we considered a minor modification of a lemma from Yona Popa and uh, Peterson's paper that I uh, just mentioned uh, a while back that allows you to deduce unitary conjugacy from the intertwining. So this is yet one of the examples where you can deduce unitary conjugacy from intertwining. And uh, this is one of the key ingredients that goes into the proof. And the step two is, now that you have identified the codes, um, you want to do something about the acting groups. And uh, what we want to show is that the acting group Q has to be identifiable with the acting group P over here. And let's just pause for a second over here. Suppose you could do that. Sion, right on the notes. Sion yeah. this is your two minute warning you requested. All right, thank you. So it's, uh, that's great because uh, I have uh, only a little bit more to say. So suppose you could show on the nose that um, the acting group Q goes to the acting group P. Well, the note is that because uh, Q has to invary the uh, core over here and P invaries the core over here because of this identification, this part has to uh, remain invariant, right? Which means that intuitively something that should happen to this projection, it should somehow get fixed. And that can only mean that the projection has to be its identity. And that is precisely the intuitive feeling that goes into it. And uh, to, to formalize it, uh, what we could show is that um, you have uh, that um, the group von Neumann algebra of the acting group is identifiable up to unitary conjugacy with the group von Neumann algebra of the acting group on the right hand side. And moreover, 
this uh, already these two so facts uh, and you can use a technique from Yona Popa and Fasser's paper, this notion of height would actually tell you that uh, it's, uh, not only it's uh, R, Q and P identifiable, but also that this projection P has to be equal to one. In fact, we had to use something a little bit different technically. We had to use a notion of uh, height from Kroger and Fass, a related lemma by Kroger and Fass, which has, uh, allows us to conclude that P is equal to one and that uh, this acting group Q actually maps to the acting group P. And uh, that is basically a very, very, very broad overview of the group that we had. And that is basically all that I wanted to say. So thank you for your attention.